So um, good evening, everyone in India, and good afternoon and good morning to people wherever they live. And today's uh, topic is about the role of institutions in developing economies and and the effect of corruption on uh, on the on these economies. So, for example, Darren Ashmoglu and um, uh, James Robinson wrote this bestseller book, Why Nations Fail. Mm -hmm. And in this book, they, they say the reasons why countries, uh, some countries do well and some countries fail, is because institutions, institutions, and institutions. Also, in solo model, if you see, some countries never get onto the curve; they just remain poor, and and they're stuck in the poverty trap. They don't even reach the middle-income countries level, and that's also because of poor development of. Uh, um, institutions in these uh, in these countries. For example, and a research paper which Sergey introduced me to talks about how uh, they did an analysis of um, of Nigerian diplomats in Norway and Norwegian diplomats in Nigeria, and the research was based on the parking tickets. And the study identified that uh, Norwegian diplomats five years in Nigeria started committing as much violations, parking violations, as the Nigerians and Nigerian diplomats in Norway Norway after five years. Started behaving like the Norwegians, so very less uh, 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 or parking fines and so on and so forth. So this this clearly says how the, the the society in which people live determines, and this society is shaped based on the rules and implementation of the rules. For example, also the Russian conundrum. For example, in 30s and 40s, most economists in the world, also in the West, said Russia is going to be the next development model. Among other things, one of the reasons why Russia could not become one of the most developed countries is also because of uh, poor development of institutions. And again, if you look, there is also clear correlation between incentives to commit crime, which is based on how uh, the judiciary functions and probability in which the crime could be uh, found out and punishment could be delivered. So, so going back to in Indian context, Indian context, India was grow, India grew very fast from 19 uh, early 1990s until the mid 2000s or maybe until 2010, 2012, 2013, uh, and after that. Maybe we, in the last seven eight years, the, uh, the growth seems to be uh, stuck, and we are we are trapped in an, um, uh, in a middle income uh, trap, and that's mostly because of uh, the institutions in India. And again, over the last uh, five six years, and most after 2019, most institutions are being uh, are being degraded and destroyed with each passing day. For example, the judiciary in India does not uh, work in a fair manner. The judiciary now gives verdict based on who is who's the plaintiff and who uh, and so on and so forth so it's it's clearly very arbitrary and with this i would like to introduce a panel the uh, the first is dr uh, ptr pandimel tyagrajan the honorable uh, minister for finance and hrm and he was formerly the uh, managing director of uh, standard chartered bank offshore markets and then we have sergey gurev he was the former rector of uh, the new uh, moscow university and then the former chief economist of uh, ebrd and now he's a professor at sianspo uh, where he teaches econ economics and political economy. And not but not the least, the third the speaker would be Seema Chisti. She's a very well-renowned journalist and writer. She has been part of BBC India, uh, in Indian Express, and writes regular columns for newspaper like, such as uh, The Hindu, uh, the, uh, the, uh, and so on and so forth. With this, I, I request the Honorable Minister to speak. Thank you, Dharanidharan. Thank you uh, for inviting me to such a distinguished panel. And uh, um, my thanks to the my fellow panelists for joining us as um, in my capacity as founder of the DPF. Um, and I apologize again for running a bit late. It's just been a bit of a difficult day. Uh, I think the topic is almost not uh, worth discussing in the sense it's such a black and white issue of how deeply... Uh, the lack of institutions and the, the kind of menace of corruption affect the country's prospects. Um, I don't think there can be any debate about it. But I thought as somebody sitting in active governance, maybe I'll give a few thoughts that, uh, uh, you know, guide our policy on how we try and control these things. Uh, let me start by saying that I, in, in my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, but in almost no democracy can you separate uh, money and politics. You know, uh, sooner or later, money is used as a lubricant to buy access to communication or buy access to policy making. Uh, you know, I've lived uh, about 20 years in the US and a few years in Singapore and functioned uh, professionally in, I don't know, many 20 or 30 countries. And so I've not yet found a place where there's completely zero link between um, campaign contributions, lobbying, 
and uh, the function of democracy. But what I think is really uh, the dividing line is how insidious, how much of it is documented, how much of it is undocumented, and how far has it penetrated into the culture of society uh, down to every house, down to every street. And uh, in some other context, I made the observation that I don't think in Tamil Nadu, at least to my knowledge, there's not a single person I've ever met who follows every law even if it's simply the traffic uh, rules that they violate. So I think, you know, our society has evolved to a point where it's seen as uh, acceptable that uh, everybody cuts corners everywhere. And, uh, you know, surely the culture gets set at the top. So I'm not suggesting that uh, society was rotten to start with. You know, the fish has started rotting from the head down, but now it's rotten all the way to the bottom. Uh, if I go back and say, let's start from my understanding of first principles, at some level, uh, democracy, the movement of power away from a dollar to a one man, one vote was supposed to be the antidote to the kind of uh, inevitable end of all capitalist models that uh, Marx wrote about or Piketty says he's documented with data uh, in, in his book which is that the, the returns to capital keep increasing, the returns to labor keep going down. And at some point, you end up with social strife and blood on the streets. And this notion that democracy, because you start power, empowering people equally, irrespective of whether they're rich and poor, uh, is the antidote that can keep things in balance, is a powerful notion you know, in, in theory. In practice, I think, as many have spoken, it really comes down to the institutions of democracy, not just the courts, the election commissions, the, but simple things like the, you know, the motor vehicle department or the, the uh, you know, cooperative society that supplies uh, 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 rice rations, right? Because if you have functions that, uh, if you have institutions that function in a democratic way and implement a level playing field, then you have the likelihood of uh, kind of not just better uh, social outcomes, but also better economic outcomes and you have a more cohesive and a more progressive society. Uh, and inherently, many of these things are designed with built-in conflicts of interest, right? If I'm a minister, I'm the one that has to approve the policy and you know, somebody below me has to sign off on the tender. Uh, the chance of rent-seeking or the chance of rigging or nepotism are inherently very high because, uh, especially in the function of democracy that we see now, it's almost kind of a mythical cultist leadership with no real voice for the legislature. You know, it's basically the administration. The legislature died slowly till the enactment of the Anti-Defection Act, and then it died quickly uh, in terms of independence. And the judiciary, especially the last few years, has become perhaps a shadow of itself, perhaps not even that. So we have these systems where uh, the, the, the functional aspects of democracy are not visible, are not evidenced and not felt. And then, of course, the question that we think about is, which is the chicken and which is the egg? Is it that functional democracies with robust institutions lead to economic success? Is it that economic success drives people to demand uh, more functional democracies and more of their institutions? And, you know, which, which is the chicken and which is the egg? I think if, you know, my limited reading, I'm not anywhere near the scholar that uh, the others are, and, you know, practicing politicians always have uh, low ratings, I would say, in this context. But uh, to me, I think it's very clear that institutions create good outcomes rather than good outcomes create institutions, though there's some mutuality and there's some cyclicality, procyclicality. And I think uh, one of the better discussions I heard on this when, we, when I was a banker, we had uh, Neil Ferguson, at that time he was at Harvard, I don't know where he is now, talk about his book, The Great uh, Degeneration, and talking about how the decay of institutions was leading to uh, economic failures and increasing um, you know, spread of wealth, uh, disparity, wealth disparity. So you know, I think if we look at corruption, the only marginal learning that I've had since I came to office is that corruption is not only about deadweight loss to the economy, it's not, it's not only about unfair outcomes, it's not only about incentivizing the, right be the wrong behavior for people to come to office. Uh, the biggest problem of corruption that I've seen is that it 
in exacerbates inequality at the micro level. And if I go to a street in my constituency or if I go to a housing colony, which was otherwise very poor area, you know, a slum, re, uh, you know, converted and set up as a multi-flat housing colony. What I find is that the humans who have access to a motor where they can tap illegally and draw the water before it goes to the rest of the people, or those who can pay off the engineer and kind of build their house uh, wall a little bit into the road. Uh, these, these guys start the ball rolling. And then since there are no consequences for that, everybody does the same thing. And pretty soon you have like the worst of all outcomes where a few people have gone at the, re the, the resources and everybody believes that's the way the world ought to work. So there's this kind of uh, social mm, kind of uh, corrosive value of, of corruption which far exceeds what I first thought of as just deadweight loss or, or uh, you know, um, inopportune gain through rent seeking. But with that, uh, let me, you know, stop and listen to brighter minds and uh, learn something. Thank you for the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your time.